All right. All right. Good morning, everyone. Morning, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, uh, welcome, uh, welcome to my talk here. Um, my talk is going to take the form of a Jupyter notebook. Um, let me first introduce myself, uh, however. Um, my name is Russell Martin. Uh, I'm a data scientist uh, at the Data Incubator. Uh, I was asked to uh, contribute a talk here uh, to the Big Data Conference uh, in Toronto. Uh, I decided I was going to talk about something um, which was relatively new to me, um, and that is topic modeling. Um, <clears throat> at the Data Incubator, we do um, various kinds of training. Uh, we have a fellowship which we offer to students, and you know we talk about machine learning and data science uh, and other tools like TensorFlow and Spark and so forth. Um, it was about six months ago. Uh, I, you know, we were we were looking around for new um topics for course material and i suggested topic modeling something which i didn't really know much about um, and i ended up writing this notebook uh, to explore this topic modeling um you know subject so i decided i was going to share that with you guys here today uh, topic modeling it's a aspect of natural language processing uh, it's an unsupervised uh, learning method. Uh, I believe there's supposed to be perhaps some way of seeing questions, but I'm not um, seeing a window for any kinds of questions here, so <coughs> apologies for that. Um, so, <coughs> so what is topic model? As you said, it's an unsupervised learning technique. Um, the, you know, the main idea is that we have a collection of documents and we want to try to group these documents uh, into, you know, similar subject matter. Uh, we have no idea a priori how many topics there are going to be uh, in this collection of documents. And, you know, I mean, that's, I guess, one of the big questions uh, of interest in this topic modeling subject. Uh, I will say more about that um, as we go along here. So, as I said, this talk is going to take the form of, um, of a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, I'm using Python, the Python programming language. Uh, we're using, uh, you know, all the open source libraries. Um, we're going to be using Scikit-Learn for some portion of this notebook, and we're going to be using the GenSem library for a different portion of this notebook. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the data that we're going to be using is a, I guess, is a well-known um, data set. It's this uh, collection of Yelp reviews of restaurants. Uh, and in fact, well, we're actually, for the purposes of this notebook, you know, we're actually going to just be using a small subset of this Yelp uh, data set. It's, if I recall correctly, there's about a million reviews. Um, I'm using only 3% um, of this data set. Uh, this was just to speed up computations. Uh, some of these computations take long enough as is using only this 3% sample of the data. Uh, I haven't even um, timed to see how long it would take on the entire data set. Uh, and also, before I jump in here, uh, I wanted to say I'm happy to um, share this Jupyter Notebook with anyone who would like to get it. Uh, my contact details are, um, are going to be at the end of this notebook here, and I could share my email address with you. So, you know, if you're interested in this, uh, drop me an email um, later and I could share this notebook with you. Um, so, as I said, topic modeling, uh, we have a collection of documents and we want to group these documents together um, into a number of topics. You know, what are people talking about? Um, there's a kind of general model is that 
Um, the idea is that there's a hidden collection of topics and words that define each of these topics. There's a so-called generative model um, of topic modeling, which I could say a little bit about uh, later on, you know, about how we have a collection of topics and words that define the topics. And in a kind of random type of fashion, we could think about how a document might be generated um, using this collection of topics and words that define these topics. So uh, once again, this is an unsupervised learning technique. We don't know the number of topics in the document. Of course, that's what we're trying to figure out. Uh, we don't have any kind of labels so associated with these documents. Um, so we're trying to determine the right number of labels and which label we might assign to each document, right? In which, what is the dominant topic for a document? Uh, so, as I said, we're going to be using this um, well known well, uh, Yelp data set. So let me make my screen a bit larger here. So, and we're using a sample of 3% of the data just for the purposes of illustration. Uh, this is stored on our S3 bucket on Amazon. Um, I have started this notebook running um, earlier because it does take a while to, to run. Uh, so we're the, the set of documents that we're using here is, is about 31 and a half thousand reviews. And for the purposes of doing this topic modeling, all we need is the texts in these reviews. Right, there's other information in this Yelp data set, um, but we are just going to be looking at the review text right here. So the first approach that I considered for topic modeling is to use um, clustering. Right? Clustering is a, is a well-known technique uh, in machine learning. You know, something like k-means clustering, well, I, you know, those of you familiar with machine learning, right, we, you, know, you are familiar with this clustering topic. You know, what is clustering doing? So we could take our documents and cluster them together, um, the ones that are talking about a similar topic. So, of course, to do so, we have to process our text in some fashion. And this brings up the usual um, questions when we're dealing with natural language processing, as in what kind of pre-processing do we want to apply to the documents? How do we tokenize our text? Do we remove stop words? Do we normalize our text by a limitization process? Um, how exactly do we define the similarity between documents once we've translated it into this uh, collection of numeric data? How many clusters do we divide the document into? Um, once we have the clusters, how can we figure out what actually constitutes the topics? So uh, I'll say a little bit about the pre-processing here, but I won't go into so much detail. So right, the, the tokenization is how do we break the text into tokens? Right, are we using single words, uh, bigrams, trigrams? Um, are we you know do we and do we remove stop words right so this is a question in natural natural language processing which always seems to be somewhat problematic um, in some way or another what constitutes a stop word uh, I think lots of um, texts and papers and so forth have been written about um, what constitutes a stop word and um, a Another pre-processing step that I'm going to use here is commonly known as limitization. Uh, this is a kind of normalization or regularization process. So we're going to treat, say, plural forms of words um, as the non-plural version, right? I want to treat the word um, bananas as the singular word banana. Uh, I'm as I said here, we're going to treat the word eat, eaten and ate. Uh, I want to treat them all as the word eat. So this is this process of limitization. This also includes uh, things like sort of detensing of verbs. So 
if I find the word ran, I want to treat it as the word run and walked as the word walk and so forth. So to help out with all this pre-processing, uh, we're going to use the library Spacey. Uh, Spacey is used for, um, you know, NLP work. There's uh, Spacey uh, libraries for English and various other languages. Uh, we're going to simplify our approach and we're going to use the, the so-called bag of words method. Right, we're just going to consider individual words in our documents. Of course, in doing so, right, we we could lose some of the context. Uh, as one of my colleagues likes to point out in his favorite example, you know, if I just use this bag of words approach, just looking at individual words, then the two sentences, uh, this spaghetti tastes like dog food and this dog food tastes like spaghetti, you know, those are converted into the same collection of numeric data um, if we are using just single words. Similarly, you know, man bites dog and dog bites man, well, they will be uh, converted into the same set of numeric data. But this bag of words approach, you know, is usually a common first method. Um, we won't go through many of these details. Well, we import Spacey here. Uh, we define a, uh, a limitization method here. Uh, again, this is using Spacey to perform this limitization process. Uh, we throw away some things like punctuation and some symbols and conjunctions and a few other uh, symbols. And we're going to use uh, Spacey's built-in set of English stop words. Um, this is maybe a slightly strange uh, set of stop words. Uh, if I recall correctly, for example, um, six is a stop word, uh, eight is a stop word, but seven is not a stop word. Um, but we will use a set of stop words and uh, once we have our limitization process in hand, well, this is where we wheel in scikit-learn. So we're going to use scikit-learn uh, vectorizers and transformers. So we're going to count our words using the scikit-learn count vectorizer. And then we're going to apply the, uh, the term frequency inverse document frequency on top of the count vectorizer using the TF-IDF transformer from scikit -learn. Uh We do this in this two-step process, well, because we want to actually make use of uh, information from the count vectorizer uh, later on when we are analyzing our topics. <clears throat> Uh, and also, in the interest of time, um, we are just limiting ourselves to the uh, thousand terms with, you know, with the most um, frequent occurrences in our text. Um, so, I mean, right, if you are familiar with scikit-learn, well, the using the count vector, the count vectorizer and the TF-IDF uh, transformer are um, well-known uh, procedures. Um, and so this will translate our features uh, into, you know, numeric values. Uh, this matrix right here is um, our sparse matrix. We have um, nearly 988, sorry, 898,000 uh, rows, or sorry, columns, uh, sorry, excuse me. We, of course, have a thousand columns. We have nearly 898,000 non-zero elements in our matrix. Um, how do we measure similarity now between these documents, between the rows of the sparse matrix? Uh, here, you know, we are using uh, the usual notions of Euclidean distance. Right? Each, um, each row uh, is corresponding to one of our documents. Um, if we look at the 
uh, you know, if the difference of their vectors is small in length, you know, that's the Euclidean distance between two rows. This is how we're going to measure similarity. <clears throat> so we said um, our first approach here is to apply k-means clustering. So we have this feature matrix now, and we're going to apply k-means clustering to this feature matrix. And as we said, um, k-means clustering is using this idea of Euclidean distance between the rows in this feature matrix in this thousand dimensional space that we have constructed right here. <coughs> now, <clears throat> again, k-means clustering is a, a well-known method uh, included in scikit-learn. I have arbitrarily begun my process by uh, choosing five clusters. And we'll say more about uh, how we might go about determining what is the right number of clusters uh, for k-means clustering. But well, we needed a starting point, so I selected five as a number of clusters. And uh, we create an instance of k-means and call our fit method. And um, after, you know, after I think it was about 10 minutes or so, well, um, scikit-learn returns the clustering. Uh, of course, the clustering has a collection of centers, which are the coordinates of each center of the clusters. And using the cluster centers, this is how we um, can try and find what are the words in each topic. Uh, I can combine the cluster centers together with the feature names of the vectorizers from before. And I could pull out, say, again, somewhat arbitrarily, I selected the top 10 words <coughs> from each cluster. Right, these are the words that, um, you know, have the largest um, magnitude in these cluster centers. <coughs> So we see, well, we have our five clusters. I have ones, um, well, I have things like cheese and food and burger. Um, this cluster here, well, these are going to be talking more about service. Uh, again, I have cheese here in cluster two, uh, but I see the word pizza. So you know, it's not surprising to me that I have words in common. But, uh, you know, we should have some words which are distinguishing between these clusters. Uh, cluster here talking about, oh, maybe some kind of uh, friendly atmosphere in the service. Uh, I want to hear, I see, you know, a different word. Um, you know, this maybe it's clusters. People are talking about the great chicken that's to be found in all these restaurants. So, you know, k-means clustering gives us a first approach to try and group these documents together. I could, of course, look at um, a larger number of words uh, in these topics. <clears throat> now, you know, having determined the clusters, um, we, you know, can we figure out something more about our clustering right here? Um, I could get the, the word counts um, using our count vectors, our count vectorizer that we've computed before. Um, and, you know, I could look at these individual number of occurrences in each document uh, if I wanted to do so. Uh, these are the columns right here. You know, I just put together the collection of all of these top words. Which, uh, which, which we selected for these clusters. You can see there's a significant kind of overlap, and then I only have 28 unique words when I group all of these uh, top words together right here. If I wanted to, I could look closer at these individual word counts. Um, I On this pandas data frame, well, we added in um, a indication of which cluster 
that a document belongs to. Um, I could say, well, how many documents are there in each cluster? And we could see in some ways that this data set might be kind of unbalanced in, in this topic modeling kind of content, right? There's a large percentage of our documents, I mean, essentially more than half our collection of documents were put into one cluster. And I have some other clusters, a few of which are actually rather small. Um, you know, we could look at what are the frequency, what are the top words uh, within each cluster. I mean, again, because the, this cluster number four is rather large, well, cluster number four is generally dominating the number of occurrences for a lot of these words. This is this purplish kind of color right here. Right, I have the word um, uh, restaurant, for example. Well, these are basically all reviews of food establishments. So it's not surprising to see the word restaurant. Um, there's this topic number two, well, which dominates the appearance of this weird pizza. Uh, to me, you know, that's at least suggesting our clustering is making some sense that, right, most everything that uses the word pizza appears in this cluster number two. Uh, I have, well, you know, the word um, burger, well, this appears in this cluster zero, for example. So I could look at these individual frequencies of these top 10 words. And, you know, this is suggesting to me that my clustering is making some sense where I see different clusters are dominating some particular words here. Um, and this, to me, this also suggests, well, maybe there's actually some, a few more words we might want to add to our list of stop words. Um, this word good right here, well, yeah, it's appearing a lot in cluster four, but it doesn't seem to distinguish a whole lot between the other three clusters. Uh, this, word, this word atmosphere right here, well, it's not really helping to distinguish between our clusters, so we might consider adding this to our list of stop words and re, you know, redoing our clustering and see if we might um, you know, change our clusters significantly or not. Uh, of course, I could look at something like, you know, what's the relative frequency of words in like a word cloud? So here are topic zero. Well, I have topic zero, so you're kind of dominated by this weird burger. Uh, if I change topics, well, all right, I've got food order time. Uh, here's our topic that's talking about pizza, mostly, and so forth. So, you know, this, I could use this to, again, look at these top words <clears throat> and see which is kind of dominating each of my five topics right here. Uh, as another way I could try, you know, I'm not very good at looking into a thousand dimensional space in my mind. Um, so uh, we could try and visualize our clustering in a lower dimensional space. So we could use something like um, PCA, principal component analysis, and project, you know, our thousand dimensional feature space into a lower dimensional space where I could try to visualize it. And uh, in fact, well, let's project our thousand dimensional feature space all the way down into two components. And, you know, then I can actually draw the element, you know, the projected elements from my clustering into this two dimensional feature space and color them according to the clustering. You can see, well, there's this kind of aqua color right here um, for one of the clusters. This seems pretty well separated from the other clusters. There's this kind of light green cluster, which again, mostly seems pretty well separated. I have some kind of mixing of the other clusters. 
but this is, you know, I view this as a limitation in a sense of projecting my thousand dimensional vector space down into two dimensions. <clears throat> but, you know, again, this, at least to me, this suggests that my clustering and I was doing a pretty good job of separating some of these clusters from others, at the very least. So to me, you know, this was the, the kind of difficult part of the topic of modeling in some sense as well. How can I maybe try to verify my clusters are kind of, you know, well-defined and they're well-separated? <clears throat> um, it's trying to find some way of visualizing my results. And, you know, then we come back to this important question, right? I started with five clusters. And as I said, five was kind of arbitrary. You know, it's a small enough number that I could easily examine these top words. I could easily draw a, uh, a projection, the, you know, the, the principal component analysis here. And I, you know, dealing with five different colors, well, my eyes can kind of visually distinguish between them. But is five the right number of clusters? And for the k-means clustering method, um, the common way of trying to determine what's the right number of clusters is by using the so-called silhouette score. And uh, again, well, I could look at the uh, so I can learn documentation for the silhouette score, or the silhouette coefficient. And the main idea is, well, we use the mean intra-cluster distance. What do I mean by mean intra-cluster distance? I take one of my clusters and I compute the distance between every pair of points inside that cluster and take that average distance. So every pair of points in one cluster, what's the average distance? And then I want to look at, well, here's one cluster and here's, you know, a separate cluster. What's the, what's the distance from a point in one cluster to the closest other cluster? And that's this mean nearest cluster distance for each sample. So I take a point. I look at all the points outside of the cluster and, you know, what's the closest point uh, outside of that cluster to each point. And I take the mean of these nearest distances. And this silhouette coefficient then is defined by this difference. So I look at uh, the difference of the mean nearest cluster distance and I subtract the uh, the mean intra cluster distance and I divide this by this maximum value. Now the silhouette coefficient there for um, gives you a number for <clears throat> which is between um, minus one and one. And, you know, this is defined um, for each point in my, um, in my data, in my data set. Um, a silhouette coefficient of minus one for some point basically means, well, I've, I put a sample in the wrong cluster. You know, this means that the, the nearest distance, the nearest cluster distance is smaller than the intra-cluster distance, right? I've got, I've done something wrong. I put a point in the wrong cluster. <clears throat> uh, the best values for these clusterings is one. But, you know, in general, right, I'm going to have some value somewhere between zero and one. Values closer to one means that my clustering is kind of more well-defined. I have clusters which the points are near to each other and the clusters are far away from each other in my feature space. So values closer to one in some sense are saying, well, this is a more well-defined clustering. 
I could use um, I could use this silhouette score here to judge how good my clustering is. Um, Scikit Learn conveniently provides a silhouette score. You give it your um, feature matrix, right? Our feature matrix of TFIDF transform values and the labels that define the clustering. And Scikit Learn will compute a silhouette score for you. Uh, we can <clears throat> we could compute clusterings and silhouette scores for a you know for different values, uh, different numbers of clusters. And again, this is a time-consuming process, and so um, you know this was done, and we stored values for uh, different numbers of clusters with the corresponding silhouette score. And it's not necessarily obvious in here, right? Well, what's, which number of clusters right here maximizes the silhouette score <clears throat> out of all of these values that we tried? Well, the maximum silhouette score occurs when I choose 20 for my number of clusters. Now, you know, we might argue, well, 20 is a bit more difficult to work with. Right? Do I really want to try and deal with 20 clusters, um, 20 different topics in my collection of topics here for this data? Um, if you look closely, well, there's actually a dip in the silhouette score um, when we went from 14 to 15 clusters. So I have this value for a silhouette score for, for 14 clusters. It actually decreased a little bit when I went when I went from 14 to 15 clusters. So maybe this is saying, well, our X14 might be a more reasonable value, even though for 20 I have a larger silhouette uh, coefficient here. And of course, you know, as I said, there's here there's still some judgment involved, right? I I want a kind of small reasonable number of clusters that I could deal with. Is 14 reasonable? Uh, well, it's probably more reasonable than 20. But you know, I could I could change my number of clusterings and uh, change my number of clusters, recompute my k-means clustering, and go back and look at you know some of these visualizations uh, that I computed before. You know, see if this gives me a better clustering. Um, you know, from a from a kind of intuitive point of view, right? Are my clusters still well defined in terms of the words that are appearing in them, and so forth? So, you know, finding the right number of topics is we could be guided by this silhouette score here, but you know, it's still going to be a judgment call. You know, what's what's a reasonable number of clusters that you want to try and deal with? If I wanted to further use this information for other purposes. But uh, at that point I said, all right, well, can we compare this k-means clustering method for topic modeling with another method for performing topic modeling? And the other method that I chose to look at was one which is called latent Dirichlet allocation. And the idea of latent Dirichlet allocation, um, it's, it's more, it's trying to realize uh, this topic modeling um, paradigm that I mentioned before, namely that a topic consists of a mixture of a number of words, and a document is a mixture of topics. I generate a document, at least in the abstract way. I could think of generating a document by um, generating a document word by word. For every word, I will determine what topic that word is going to apply to. And then once I've figured out which topic, uh, you know, a word corresponds to, well, what word is actually going to be selected from that topic? 
obviously this isn't going to give us, you know, nice, well-defined English sentences. But this is the the mathematical model that's underlying this latent Dirichlet allocation model. So once again, you know, I want to generate a document. Well, first, for word one, what topic is that word corresponding to? And this will be selected according to some probability distribution over the topics. And then once I've determined what topic that word course corresponds to, well, I need to actually choose a word from that topic. And that particular word is chosen according to some other probability distribution over a set of words for a topic. This is the so-called generative model for topic modeling. The, the training process, right, and the machine learning algorithm that defines latent Dirichlet allocation, the training process is like, well, you're trying to learn these unknown probability distributions. You know, a document is a mixture of topics. Well, like, what's the mixture of topics that's going to appear in a particular document? And then once I've determined that mixture, well, then I have to actually generate the words that correspond to the document. Well, <clears throat> and it's this process of these sort of random choices that would end up generating a particular document. Uh, I'm not going to go into more details about how this learning process or the training process is learning these unknown probability distributions. Um, but it's a kind of, you know, this is described in the scikit-learn documentation. Um, you know, and if you're interested in reading about um, this generative model and how or how you might go about learning these probability distributions, you could find more information in the scikit-learn documentation and elsewhere. Now, even though I pointed you towards the scikit-learn documentation on latent Dirichlet allocation, we're actually going to use a different library to perform this LDA um, process. <clears throat> In particular, we're going to use the GenSim library to do this topic modeling for us for um, using this latent Dirichlet allocation kind of model. So we still have to prepare our text, you know, in a similar fashion, right? I want to tokenize my text, remove stop words, limitize my text, and so forth. Um, I'm still going to use Spacey to help out, um, but I'm also going to use tools from Gen from the GenSim library to, to do that. Uh, we're also going to um, basically concentrate on what are the, the words I want to select. I'm going to choose my nouns, my proper nouns, my adjectives, my verbs, and my adverbs from the words in my reviews. And I'm basically going to be, you know, ignoring other words. So it's a kind of a combination of, yeah, I'm going to remove stop words. I'm also going to remove, you know, certain parts of speech just to try and concentrate, you know, on the most useful words in my reviews. And so, you know, you can see, right, for example, if this is the original text and I pass this text through my pre-processing stages, this is, um, this is the collection of words that I end up with. So, um, you know, right, the word not is actually removed which again might be somewhat unfortunate, but we have to make choices about how we're going to process our text, right? The, the words had and the are removed. Um, you know, lots of the filler words in a sense are removed. You know, things like, uh, words like group is normalized, groups is normalized to the word group. And school kids um, is normalized to school kids and so forth. Mm. Uh, GenSim has an LDA model class. 
um, I need to essentially vectorize my text using GenSim's tools instead of Scikit-Learn's tools because they will give me, you know, they'll give them to me in the right format. So I need to create a dictionary and uh, similar to the count vectorizer and TFIDF tran transformers in Scikit-Learn, um, GenSim gives me this doc to BOW, doc to bag of words kinds of process. So I will tokenize my text and generate um, my sort of feature matrix. And then I pass all this information to GenSim's LDA model. Um, I'm not going to talk about all these kinds of choices that I can make right here, but basically this corpus right here is my process text. And my dictionary is my collection of tokens. Um, from my process text. Again, I went for five topics to start with. And I mean, why did I want to use GenSim's LDA model? Well, because Gen this actually gives me a lot of kind of useful information about my topics that result. Like once I build this model, I can use this, there's a print topics method and I can specify a number of top words and I have this kind of mixture going on here, right? This is saying, well, for cluster zero, I have these mixture of, of these top 10 words. So these numbers, this 0 0.032 and the, and the 0 0.012 and so forth, these are essentially referring to this probability distribution on the mixtures of words that define the topic. You know, here, well, it's kind of like it's saying, well, with a about a 3.2% probability, I'm going to choose the word good if I if my topic is corresponding to topic zero. And you know, with a probability of 1.2%, well, I'm going to choose this word time. So, you know, this actually gives me a little more insight into the, the mixture of words, the probability distribution on the words which are supposed to define this topic. I can't get that kind of information easily out of the k-means method. I can't even really get this information easily uh, if I use like it learns um, LDA class but the Jensen method um, provides this information to me. <clears throat> you know, I could see here, well, right, here's a topic. Oh, again, I have a topic that's talking about burgers. Oh, this one's talking about chicken and tacos. Here's one that's talking about pizza. Well, I don't have pizza anywhere else in these topics. Um, I hear the topic is talking about ooh, sushi. Well, I might want to investigate that topic a bit further. You know, sushi and crab and shrimp and so forth. Right. And again, you know, this is giving me a mixture over the words and the individual topics. And to me, this is kind of providing a little more insight than I was getting from the k-means method. Um, and you know, I could I could change this number of top words, and um, you know, have a larger collection of words in each topic, if I wanted to do so. Here, before I was having ten words, now I could have fifteen words, and look at the you know the relative percentages of words and so forth. Mm. Now. Another thing that the LDA model, you know, again, like I could look at the cluster labels for the k-means method. Well, for <clears throat> for the Jensen LDA model, I can actually say um, for a particular document, like what's the mixture of topics for that document? Right. Oh, this first review is mostly you know dominated by this topic number two. Right, it's about 33% of topic number two and 26% of topic number four and some smaller mixtures of other topics. 
So I could, you know, I could look at a bit more refined information about these mixtures for individual reviews. Um, I could do a little more work here and I could say, all right, well, for each document, what's the dominant, dominant topic for that particular document and what's the percentage? Right, so for my, <clears throat> for my first review, well, it's dominated by this topic number two, about one third of the time. Uh, document number one, well, it's as the dominant topic is zero, about 1% and so forth. And so again, this is the, the richer set of information that GenSEM's LDA model provides to me. I could say, all right, what, you know, again, how many um, documents are in each topic? Well, this is also kind of um, verifying, right, some of the information that I, that I found before for the k-means method, right? I have most of my documents are appearing in one particular topic. And, you know, we saw a similar kind of distribution for the k-means method. So, you know, both methods, well, they, you know, they're sort of validating one another in some ways, right? That the K-means method was saying, well, one topic um, mostly dominated my collection of topics, right? I, for the K-means clustering, I had more than one half of the documents in one cluster. I don't quite have, you know, one half, but I have a large number for one topic and smaller numbers for others. So, as I said, they're sort of validating each method is kind of validating each other in some ways. Uh, GenSEM gives me a, um, or I could do a bit of work and I could say, well, what's the most representative sentence by, you know, choosing, um, maximizing this percent for each particular topic, right? Here's a dominant, here's a particular document. Well, the dominant topic is, you know, 98.4% by this one topic. So I could, using this information again from Jensen, well, I could pull out things that might be a kind of representative for each topic. Um, and, and, you know, I could look at the original document as well, right? I have these indices, so I could look at this original document and see what they're actually saying. Um, I was a little surprised when I was doing this and I said, oh, hang on, there's actually, you know, some reviews in French included in this Yelp data set. I wasn't expecting that. <clears throat> um, you know, we could, you know, identifying, oh, that there are some reviews in French. Well, then I might go back and, and I might want to look at what languages are actually present in this Yelp data set. I was assuming probably naively that these were all, all English reviews. Um, right, you know, and you might say, well, this, this dominant topic um, for this particular document is topic three. Are there actually other, you know, are there lots of other French reviews in topic number three? I, I don't know, I could go back and take a look and see if there are more French reviews, for example. Um, how could I, of course, this brings up a question, how could I identify the actual language of a review? Well, I could wheel in other um, libraries, right? The Natural Language Toolkit uh, in Python has a method which will actually try to identify a language that a text has been written in. I didn't bring that in here. But, you know, I, I could, I could go back and take a closer look and say, well, are all my, you know, what languages are present in my reviews? As I said, I was naively assuming these reviews were all uh, in English. So I was a bit surprised when I started stumbling across French reviews and so forth. Um, again, I could, I could do kind of similar analysis, right? You know, here, I, I, for some reason, um, I, I said, well, let's look at the, the length of the documents in each topic. I said, um, are these, you know, are these reviews kind of long or short? And it was a little interesting that 
topic zero, we could see that the, the mean length was about 33 and a half or 33.6. Other topics, well, the reviews were actually longer. You know, and, and um, I don't exactly know what this means. Um, you know, off the top of my head, I would have to go and look at these reviews, right? Topic number three, well, these are actually longer reviews. I have about 68 words versus topic zero. Well, I had only 46, only 33 words, All right? They're sort of, you know, they're like double in length. I remember topic zero was this one where most of the reviews were occurring. So, you know, right, we have a lot of like short reviews. Are the short reviews less informative somehow, or are they ones that people pay more attention to? I haven't even factored in, um, you know, the kind of star ratings um, for these for these reviews. Um, something similar uh, to what we did before, right? You know, what are the what are the like top words in each in each topic? Uh, this is a bit small here. I can make this a bit larger. Let's see if we could. Right, word frequencies. Well, again, you know, I I have my you know my topic zero here is the one which has the most documents, so it's not surprising that. I have big word frequencies for topic zero for some of these. Uh, you know, but again, I could I could look and see. Well, you know, this this word crab right here, while it was appearing in my uh, in my mixture of words, well, it's not appearing in very many documents. But I guess this, you know, is actually helping to differentiate between some of these um, different topics here. Um, you know, what are the, the top words we found in both of our topic modeling methods? What's our common top words? Um, we taking our top 10 words uh, for the LDA method and putting them all together. We had 37 distinct words um, for the K-means method. We had 28. Um, here our words in common are 21. So 21 of these 28 from k-means and 37 from the LDA method are, are found by both. These are kind of used to define the topics. Again, if I select the, the top, you know, the top 10 from each topic and put them together. And I mean, my last remark here, well, again, five was arbitrary. Why five topics? Well, in the k-means method, we have the silhouette score, which we could use to try and guide us for the correct number of topics. Um, the LDA model has something which they refer to as coherence. Um, and this is supposed to, you know, model how we as humans might interpret um, topics. So I'm not going to go into the details of how Jensen's LDA um, model or how this coherence model is computing these coherence scores. But again, uh, you know, this will compute a score for us. And the idea is, well, higher coherence scores are supposed to be referring to better, well-defined topics. And again, I could I could compute these coherence scores. I could redo the LDA modeling for different numbers of topics, and you know, compute coherence scores for these topics. Um, and well, out of these, at least these four numbers that I have you know, computed here, well, right, five actually gives me the highest coherence score. You know, six, seven, and eight have a smaller coherence score. So, you know, at least according to the LDA model, and of these four scores that I've computed, right, five is is better than six, seven, or eight in terms of the number of topics. 
you know, I could go back and try again for, you know, for four. But it's, you know, I thought it was interesting, of course, that the LDA model here is finding that five seemed to be pretty good uh, versus the k-means method, you know, is finding, oh, it should be like 20. So um, I will leave things there for for this talk. Um, as I said, my email right here, you can see on the screen, uh, my email address is uh, Russell, that's my first name, so R-U-S-S-E-L-L, um, at the data incubator .com. Uh, As I said, I'm happy to share um, this notebook with people who are interested in it. Um, and I, I wish I um, might have had some window where I could see questions, um, which might be missing somehow on my uh, Teams window here. So um, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, you know, I welcome questions via email. Um, I, you know, as I said, I made this topic modeling notebook because this was something that I was interested in. I didn't know much about the tools which are available. And, you know, I found this an interesting, um, an interesting subject to work on here. And hopefully, you know, this will give you a little more insight into the kinds of tools which are available in Python for this topic. So thank you very much for your attention. And I guess um, because I can't see if there are questions or not, I will pass things um, back to uh, those in charge. So I said I, I, I can't see a window that has questions in it, so I can't answer questions. I, I don't have such a window on my screen. So apologies to those in the audience. If you're asking questions, I somehow don't seem to have a window um, on my screen where I could answer those questions. <laughs>